What I'm going to do today is I'm going to start uh, essentially with some background information and a couple clarifications of terms. Um, and then I'm going to move into um, the actual research that I did on this, um, which involved interviewing seven uh, different professionals in the country uh, who employ this double and have found full-time employment through employing the double. Okay? Um, I'm going to move into the information that I gathered from them. Um, then finally, uh, I, we're going to bring up Dr. Ben Pierce for the last uh, about 10 minutes um, so that you guys can ask questions um, uh, of him as he is one of the premier, if not the premier doubler in the world. Okay. So the first thing um, I want to start off with is just a brief clarification of terms. Um, when I use the term doubler or doubling, I'm simply referring to uh, a person who plays two or more instruments. Uh, it came to my attention, was brought to my attention by Dr. Matthew Trotman, um, that some people associate or have a negative connotation associated with the word doubling, um, and that there's the assumption that there's a primary instrument and a secondary instrument, um, and that one of those takes precedence for the performer over the other. Okay, One I'm good at, one I'm not as good at. Okay, For many of us, as we start, right, that is the case. Um, but I just want to clarify that when I use the term doubler, I'm going to retain the use of the word in this presentation um, rather than using an alternate such as practitioner of multiple instruments, um, simply because doubler, I think, is the most easily understood um, and it's succinct. Okay, um, So I'm going to retain the use of the word, but I mean it in, in the best possible sense, um, and everyone that I interviewed for this project um, is a doubler or practitioner of multiple instruments to the highest degree. Okay, So I just want to start off by offering them my thanks. Thanks. Um, there are many of my musical heroes, so um, again, uh, doubler simply meaning someone who plays two or more instruments. Many of these people, the or more is something that uh, actually does matter. They may double on trombone, they may double on tuba, um, they may also be conductors, they may be composers, they may consider jazz a double. We have a wide array of things that people um, from this survey uh, have come and shown us that they do. So just to begin with a brief kind of history um, and orient ourselves into past doubling trends for euphonium players. Okay, historically, euphonium players have been guided towards, um, or uh, I guess really the only, the, the primary option for doubling was on trombone. Okay? And this makes a lot of sense. Um, we see this especially uh, in military bands and wind bands. Um, and it makes a lot of sense for a couple of reasons. The first one um, is just the similarity of the mouthpiece size, right? If we are playing on similar instruments and we don't need to retrain musculature, it provides for a very easy transition between instruments, which is great. Okay, um, The transition between valves and slide is something that's a challenge, but not so much just the mouthpiece. Okay, um, Those who double on trombone are given the opportunity to play jazz, orchestral, chamber music. You have opportunities in brass quintet, and you have lots of students to teach. Okay, um, And it's just generally... Uh, if you have three or four trombones in an ensemble, you may have one person that's out or sick for a concert, so we need an extra trombone. Euphonium player has always fit that role extremely well. So following these trends, right, because we had so many people doubling on trombone, uh, research actually followed these trends. Okay, so we have articles on the topic of euphonium trombone doubling published uh, in the following journals, the International Trombone Association Journal, the TUBA Journal, which is now the ITEA Journal, the Instrumentalist Magazine, uh, we have dissertations published on the topic, uh, and we have books um, such as The Low Grass Player's Guide to Doubling, which was recently written by Micah Everett. Uh, as I began research in this area, um, I found uh, Dr. Everett's book, and I thought that my uh, that everything I was going to do was squash because I assumed, okay, you know, he's got all these chapters and everything. He must have a chapter on euphonium tuba doubling. Uh, but interestingly enough, even today, uh, that chapter did not exist in the book. What we did have chapters on uh, were tenor trombone and bass trombone doubling, uh, bass trombone on tenor trombone doubling, doubling on two or more of the same sizes of instrument. Uh, not euphonium to tuba, though that's not what that meant. Trombonist doubling on euphonium, trombonist doubling on tuba, tuba players doubling on euphonium, euphonium and tuba players doubling on trombone, doubling on alto trombone, contrabass trombone, bass trumpet, chimbasa. So it's, a, it's an extremely comprehensive book and very well written, um, but the chapter for euphonium players doubling on tuba wasn't there. Um, so I was honestly very surprised uh, when I found the book. But it was good for me because it meant I could continue my research. Okay. 
different uh, documents that we have for euphonium trombone doubling uh, give us detailed information for the following. First-hand information from professionals who employ the double. Okay, you can readily find that. Difficulties unique to the double and approaches to overcome them. Similarities and differences between euphonium and trombone playing. Reverse benefits of euphonium trombone doubling on the primary instrument. Uh, this is one that I did not initially think of, but I found there's a dissertation by uh, Dr. Jamie Lipton, uh, who did her work at the University of North Texas as well, and she makes an extremely compelling argument um, for the benefits um, of trombone euphonium doubling uh, that it has on, on uh, I guess, the individual's euphonium playing. Right? We would think if I'm splitting time between these two instruments, I'm going to, you know, I don't have as much time to practice euphonium, I'm going to get worse at that. Um, but she actually articulates very well the ways in which trombone playing uh, helps your euphonium playing be better. And in pursuing trombone, the minimal amount that I have, um, I found uh, what she's written to be true. So it's uh, a very interesting document to look into. Okay, um, so we have all of these, uh, all this information, uh, but it's not available um, today um, uh, in the same way for euphonium tuba doublers, uh, which is interesting uh, given the current trends. Okay, so as we move to what we're seeing today, um, today I think you can reasonably argue that a, a double on tuba, a euphonium player doubling on tuba, is as or more beneficial than a double on trombone. Okay, both. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying one is greater or less than the other, both are extremely valuable, but I think uh, the tuba double has risen to the level of value that the trombone has provided for euphonium players in the past. Okay? At the same time, we don't have research um, to help players be able to do this. Okay? So that um, kind of became the focus of what I did with my dissertation and the collection of information um, from these individuals. Okay? Um, now, if we look at why these current trends exist, the first big one um, is the way jobs are becoming oriented. Okay? Um, and this is simply a numbers game when it comes uh, to university teaching positions. Right? You, when, uh, for low brass professors, you generally have trombone, uh, euphonium, and tuba players that the school needs to take care of in some way. Right? We need to find teachers for these three groups of people. Okay? Generally, the numbers play out so that your tuba and euphonium players if you add them together, it's about the same number as the trombone players at your school. Okay? So that provides for a very natural um, balanced load uh, for the possible hiring of two individuals if necessary or just to have one person do everything. Okay? Now if you look and think from the perspective of someone who's looking to hire someone to teach their students, I've got trombone, euphonium, and tuba I need to take care of. Um, as a euphonium player, we're kind of in a weird position because they know that we can, we can teach the euphonium students well, but I may have let's say six euphonium students and then 12 trombones that need to take care of and another six tubas. Okay? If I hire a euphonium player to do that who doubles on trombone, then I know they're going to do a great job on the euphonium thing and I can trust that they'll do a good job on the trombone, right, which takes care of 18, but then I've got this weird you know, six people left that it's really hard to find an adjunct professor um, just for that gig. Right? So, um, from the hiring person's perspective, it makes much more sense to say, okay, euphonium and tuba, I've got half of them taken care of very well, and then on this other side of the trombone, um, I can hire an adjunct for those 12 and make it a, a, a primary trombone player and know that each of these uh, students is going to be taken care of well. Also, right, the adjunct, from a hiring perspective, you know that the adjunct positions are going to be turning over uh, at a fairly regular pace. Okay, so with this pace, what is more available, a doctoral tuba student or a doctoral trombone student? Generally, we have more numbers, again, of trombone students. So if I'm looking to hire someone full-time and make sure they're taken care of and somebody adjunct, it makes sense for me uh, from that perspective to do euphonium tuba full-time. And then uh, if I can't do both full-time, then do an adjunct on trombone because I know that I'm going to have a consistent flow of students who can take care of that job well. Okay? Um, the other trends that we have um, is just the grouping of tuba and euphonium in professional organizations such as the ITEA and uh, at conferences such as this one, right? Um, there's a separate trombone conference um, and the tuba and euphonium players all come together as one family of instruments. It was interesting talking with Dr. Bowman about how this became a trend um, and uh, what he essentially told me is that as the community was forming, Right, uh, the euphonium community kind of realized we needed to be a part of something um, 
uh, in order to, to gain a seat at the table, in order to kind of legitimize our own community, right? And so he said, they, they talked with the trombone community and, you know, oh, can we do something at your conferences? And they talked with the tuba conf, you know, community um, and the, it just came down to the fact that the tuba players were welcoming, right? So he, said, he would go to these and they say, oh, tu tuba conference, yeah, come on, euphonium, tenor, tuba, that's great, cool, you guys, right? And they, they welcomed us and created this really vibrant community, um, which is part of how this kind of natural split has, has led to this trend today, okay? Um, so we've got that. Um, and then also just um, increased performance opportunities today. As a, as a tuba doubler, you have the same opportunities in orchestra, you have the same opportunities, um, not necessarily in jazz band, but in polka bands. Um, in small jazz groups, uh, being in Des Moines, I've already been contacted by mul multiple polka bands for German gigs and stuff like that. Um, so you have plenty of opportunities there as well. Okay. So moving on to the actual research and getting you guys some recommendations. The professionals that I interviewed for uh, this research include the following. Dr. Aaron Tyndall, uh, acting principal tubist of the Sarasota Orchestra and professor at the University of Miami. Dr. Benjamin Pierce, Professor of Tuba and Euphonium at the University of Arkansas. Dr. Gail Robertson, Professor at the University of Central Arkansas. Keith Kyle, a tubist with the United States Military Academy Band. Matthew Murchison, um, Tuba and Euphonium at Marshall University. Dr. Matthew Shipes, Assistant Professor of Music at Angelo State University. And Dr. Matthew Trotman, um, who teaches at the University of Arizona. Um, all of these people combined, again, represent a very wide array of career paths, and Keith Kyle is of most interest um, because I, you know, we tend to orient this towards college-level teaching, but um, uh, we have people actually just doubling on tuba who are getting professional gigs as tubists, 100%. Um, you know, Keith Kyle plays tuba for the United States Military Band, although he was a euphonium player and only studied tuba for about two years um, before winning that gig. Okay, so um, you can do you can go very far. Okay. Um, so, time to get into the good stuff. This is um, information gathered. I posed a bunch of questions to these people and then uh, combined the results. So the first one I asked was, when to start? At what point in your career did you begin doubling on tuba? Okay. And then I asked, at what point in your career would have been ideal to double on tuba? Okay. Um, there was lots of variation among the interviewees. Uh, with their answers. Okay, we had Gretchen Renshaw who um, began during her undergraduate career and had a, a, a real jump start um, on lots of our individuals. We had Gail Robertson who already had a full um, career, full-time employment as a euphonium player um, and already had a, a very successful career who decided later on in the road um, to add this double so that she could better serve her students. Okay, um, so there was a lot of variation um, but when I asked what would the ideal time have been, the answer was as soon as possible, but not before achieving some considerable success on the primary instrument. Okay, Many of our interviewees said that um, we want to make sure that you feel comfortable uh, with your musical fundamentals and the playing of the euphonium before you branch out to something. Okay, um, And they stressed this as being um, very important. Uh, the preferable time was near the end of the undergraduate degree, Right, so that if you move on to a master's degree or anything, you can continue playing and you can actually build up your skills on the secondary instrument and if desired, pursue a degree in the other instrument. Okay, um, So let's say you do your undergrad music ed, music performance, euphonium, you begin doubling on tuba during the masters and build up the skill to a level so that if you want a college teaching job, you can have tuba um, as a doctoral degree, which makes you more marketable for jobs. I did not take uh, this path. I actually ended up with three degrees in euphonium, um, and it worked out, but I will say that I, it, it was fortunate that it worked out. Um, I would say it would have been much wiser to have slightly more variation on the resume, um, but um, when it comes down to it, if if, you, if you're actually doubling, then when you go for your interview, you can play the tuba on the interview, um, and they can, they can hear you and realize that you know how to do this, although the piece of paper says euphonium instead of tuba. Okay. Uh, Gail Robertson also noted that uh, her doctorate was in euphonium because that's what she wanted to do. Okay. She wanted to have a doctorate in euphonium and continue advocating for the instrument, so she did that um, and added the tuba so that she could help her students um, as she was teaching. Okay. So selecting your first tuba. This is a big one because uh, 
time and money are limited. Okay, we have these two large categories for um, tubas. We have base tubas and contra base tubas. In case any euphonium players are unaware, the base tubas uh, separate into F and E flat, and the contra bass um, are the lower pitched instruments that are typically found in B flat and C. Okay, selecting either uh, to begin on can have benefits. Um, and negative results, um, but what I would uh, encourage you to do is consider your immediate and long-term performance goals and teaching goals, okay? You need to figure out where you want to go, and then you can figure out the best plan in order to get there, okay? So if you know that you want to teach at the collegiate level, that's one thing. If you know that you want to perform in an orchestra, that's another thing. If you know you want to teach high school, that's a totally different thing, okay? Um, so use your goals um, in order to determine what you get. So on F and B flat side, um, we have a couple benefits. They're closer in size to the euphonium. It facilitates an easier transition right away. And you can get into difficult solo repetition, uh, solo repertoire very quickly. Okay, this can be a benefit if you're looking to apply uh, for a graduate degree program somewhere and you need uh, something to perform. Okay, you can show your capabilities and um, play some, some flashier etudes to show your, your technical ability. Okay, the drawbacks um, is that if you uh, purchase this instrument alone, most orchestral and band music is out of reach. Okay, you can play it, um, but if you show up to um, your school's wind band audition and you're playing on a bass tube as opposed to a contra bass, it puts you at a serious disadvantage um, based on the music and the, the range of the music that you would be playing. Okay. Um, one other drawback to starting on this instrument that I've found um, is that uh, it may encourage you to play the instrument like a large euphonium, okay, which many of our uh, many of the interviewees talked about in quite a bit of length. Okay, um, I'll save some more discussion of that until we talk about B flat and C tubas. Um, but the benefits for uh, the B flat and C tuba are the relaxed blowing style um, being so different that it can't be approached like euphonium. Okay, we have kind of these two different ways, whether you want it to be something that's similar to what you already do, or whether you want um, to use other similarities, but for something that feels, um, what I would say is massively different. Okay, um, the blowing style on the bass tuba is so different um, that it's difficult um, to relate to the tuba, but that's, I would say that's actually a benefit um, because it forces you to think of sound concept, right? And you have to rely on kind of the song and wind um, that we have from Arnold Jacobs, the sound that you want to create, and then you allow your wind to do that, okay? Um, so I uh, personally think that that's a greater benefit than playing it like euphonium and then going to contrabass um, and then attempting again to take this thing that was kind of euphonium, turn it into something and you're kind of getting it, and then turn it into contrabass and now you're kind of not getting it, okay? Um, so both can have benefits and drawbacks. Um, for the drawbacks on the CC and B flat tube, as much solo and chamber literature uh, may be out of reach, um, and it could be uh, difficult to impress on an immediate audition if it's coming up quickly. So to split up F and E flat, um, I'll start talking about the E flat. This was mentioned by many of our doublers as a great instrument to start out with um, because of a couple things. Um, it's a step lower than the F tuba, making all of the orchestral and band lit a little bit more doable. Um, and there's a very easy transition for fingerings. Uh, many of them also mentioned the compensating system. You can find E flat tubas using the same compensating system um, as the, the compensating euphonium that you already play on. Okay, the drawbacks there though are that most of the students you teach on the tuba will not be using a compensating tuba, right? So if one of your goals is to teach tuba at the high school collegiate level and you're doing this to avoid learning a system that isn't the compensating system, you're creating more work for yourself in the long run, right? Because you can't serve those students as well as if you understood the use of the fifth valve, if you need potential sixth valve, if you just understood um, the way uh, the tubas work for what most of your students would be playing on, okay? Um, for the F tuba, uh, the benefits are that it's widely used in America um, and it enables you to be a much better uh, teacher in the, of the instrument because you are readily familiar with the use of the fifth valve with all of the intonation um, tendencies on the horn because you deal with them on a regular basis. Okay? Um, cost on both can be a benefit because they tend to be lower in cost than your contrabass tubas. Um, uh, and the drawback would be that the fingerings uh, are more difficult to learn than E-flat, but I encourage you to not use that as your deciding factor, as learning fingerings is a three to four week process. If you practice one hour a day, you will have that taken care of in three to four weeks, right? Do not try to avoid work, right? If you just do it up front, 
um, you'll save yourself so much time in the long run. Yeah. And then C versus B flat tuba, again, B flat, easy transition for fingerings. Don't use that to make your decision. Uh, if you're teaching high school or younger, this is, I, I would highly recommend playing on this tuba to make sure that you are familiar with the fingerings. And if you intend to do a lot of sousaphone playing, often pl pitched in B flat. Um, so that would help you to not get things confused in your mind as you switch between horns. Okay? Drawbacks, uh, potentially not as useful for teaching at, cult, at the collegiate level where you have more people playing C tuba. Um, yeah, and you would be teaching more C tuba. Okay, so just a few other considerations for choosing your first tuba: uh, rotary versus pistons. Um, first quote I have here is from Dr. Pierce. Rotary valves are a bit of an issue. They have a very different feel from pistons, and while it's difficult to describe, one needs to blow differently when slurring with rotary valves. Okay, um, and I agree that it's a very dif uh, the sensation is a very difficult thing to describe, and I recommend trying both. Okay, um, figure out what works for you what doesn't. Talk with your tuba playing friends. Okay, The biggest thing that I can tell you to do when it comes to uh, purchasing your first tuba is find somebody you trust and ask them questions. Okay, One of my guys that I always go to is named Zach Marley. Right? And I know he's always he's ready to talk me down off a ledge because I've, ha I've had a F tuba and I've wanted to get a C for a long time. And so I always see one for sale and it's like, Zach, is this the instrument? Is this the one I'm finally going to get? And he goes, well, if, you know, based on what you told me you want to do, no, <laughs> just keep waiting. The instrument will come up, we'll, we'll get you a good deal, right? Um, but he, he's the person that talks sense into me whenever I get too excited about things because I get really excited. Okay? Um, so find a tuba player that you trust. Um, also, um, know that um, down the line, owning multiple horns may be something that you do. Each one of the people I interviewed did, in fact, have more than one horn that they played on a consistent basis. Okay, Gretchen Renshaw James summed this up very well when she says, I own an F tuba and a CC tuba. These seem to be the standard keys of tubas that American professional tubas own, so that's why I choose to play these instruments. Okay, that's what people are playing, that's why I'm going to play, it's going to help me be a better performer and teacher. Okay. Oh, and then last thing here, don't let not having your dream tuba start, uh, stop you from starting. Let's say you just have an old messed up B-flat that's hanging out in the back of a school, right? If you know that you're at a point in your career where you need to start diversifying in this way, and if you know that it would help, start playing on the instrument, okay? I don't think you will reg regret the, the practice time that you put in on the horn, okay? So learning the double for lessons. Each individual did pursue lessons, okay? But if lessons are not available for you, I, again, I don't want you to let that be something that keeps you from starting. Okay, a student could conceivably improve very rapidly without lessons via the following process. A, listen to recordings and live performances. Create an ideal image of the sound in the head. Know what you want your tuba to sound like. B, practice. Okay, attempt to create that sound. Record yourself. Listen back. Okay, do I sound like that ideal in my head if, or not? If not, try some new things, right? Keep practicing. Is it closer to the ideal or further away? Hopefully your ideal sound keeps uh, improving as you're doing this process as well. Okay. C. So make necessary changes to get closer to the ideal sound. And D. Repeat. Okay. Um, this is how Keith Kyle. This is the process that he outlined uh, for winning his job with uh, the Military Academy Band at West Point. Um, and again, I believe he did his practicing in under two years. Um, here's a quote from him on that. Uh, he says, having been around great tubists, I just try to sound like many of my favorites. Andy Smith, Nimrod Ron, James Lamb, Tony Niffen, and many others. I did incessant listening to the Picorni excerpt CD and Davis 20-minute warm-up. Chris Olka's YouTube channel is a gold mine. I recorded my practice every day and just tried to sound like my favorite parts of each of their playing. Okay? And he did not have consistent lessons while he was doing this. He was working... Um, I believe with Tim Northcutt at the time, uh, but these lessons were on and off, um, and he was teaching himself just by listening and imitating the sound, okay? Um, so don't let that stop you either. Okay, so challenges to expect and how to overcome them. The next questions were around sound concept, use of air, phrasing, embouchure flexibility, low, middle, and high register, slurring, articulation, intonation, uh, if any particular notes on the horn were difficult, finger facility, and reading. So let's get through all of these. Hopefully I have time here. Sound concept. Okay, sound concept came relatively easy for most. Um, and this uh, is, a, is a really important place to start. Again, you really need to have the idea of how you want to sound um, in order to achieve that sound. Um, uh, another quote from Ben Pierce. I believe very strongly that sound concept needs to be developed by listening and imitating. 
Thus, a euphonium player had better listen to good tuba playing if he she wants to sound good on the tuba. Use of air, embouchure, and other aspects of technique will follow if the, count, if the sound concept is strong. Okay, so start with the concept. Everything else has a tendency to fall into place. Uh, Dr. Shipes, I did a lot of listening and recording. This is something that David Zirkel helped me with a lot at UGA. This is connected to my use of air as well. I tended to blow air that is too fast and too narrow, like a euphonium. This creates an okay sound, but one that is too bright and focused. With tuba, especially contrabass tuba, the default approach needs to involve slow, wide, thick air that produces a darker sound. I can do this now, but it does not feel natural, and is something I have to think about. Um, that I have to think about doing. Okay, which brings me back to the idea um, of the contrabass as actually being a good starting point. Right? We can't rely on the muscle memory. We can't rely um, so much on. Uh, the feel that we have from the euphonium, it forces us to start from the point of sound concept, okay? Because if you're on this contrabass and you're getting the sound concept of a tuba, okay, you're trying to sound like a tuba and play, and play the tuba as opposed to playing the tuba like euphonium, okay? Use of air, okay? Generally, everyone uh, prescribe a slower, wider air column, okay? So each one of these quotes um, has to do with that. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Dr. Trotman here, he said, if I approached a tuba with euphonium air, I would often get no response at all when trying to start a note. On tuba, I had to learn what I think of as a slower, wider air column. That's a pretty great summation right there um, of what all of our um, respondents said, okay? And back to sound concept, tuba versus euphonium, okay? Uh, I asked, do you guys think of the sound concepts differently? Or, or the same, okay? And we had actually a very wide array of answers here, so I kind of want to go through a few of these um, so that you um, have a couple things that you can use in your own playing. I, I wouldn't say one is correct and one is wrong, but they're all different and all of these guys sound great, so take, take what you like. Uh, Aaron Tyndall, very different sound concepts for me. I think of brilliance for euphonium and a dark core-filled sound for tuba, okay? Um, Matthew Trotman was similar. My concept for euphonium sound includes the idea of brilliance or brightness, of projecting like an operatic tenor. This concept does not apply for tuba to me. Uh, at the same time, Matthew uh, Murchison says, the general sound concept is basically the same for me over most of the range of the instrument, and similar to that for uh, Dr. Shipes. He said, I think the sound concept is largely the same between euphonium, F-tuba, and C-tuba. They just differ in range. This means that my ideal high range sound on the tuba is identical to a euphonium sound, and my ideal low range sound on a euphonium is identical to a tuba sound. Okay, so some different ways to approach the differences uh, between the two instruments, but all of them, again, have had very positive results. So. Okay, phrasing. Um, this is another uh, category that I think is a massive reverse benefit. Okay, the tuba forces us um, to use our air more efficiently, and it become, uh, helps us to become uh, innately aware of how much air we have to use, okay? In my lessons with Don Little at UNT, um, I, it, it essentially boiled down to little tricks, becoming aware of where I was in a phrase, um, when I'm supposed to play soft, actually play soft, <laughs> so that you have air to make it through a phrase, and then um, he made my crescendos much more effective by asking me to wait for things, um, and then give more of the crescendo near the end. Sounds like a simple idea, but something that didn't really click for me um, until I played tuba, and then it was like, oh, that's, that's what you mean, and then I was able to apply it to euphonium playing um, pretty quickly. Okay, so phrasing is something you don't want to allow the tuba um, to make your phrasing worse, and it's a great idea to take the phrasing that you've learned on euphonium and apply it from day one. Okay, yeah, that's your biggest advantage as a euphonium player. I should probably make this is a bigger point than um, I'm making it right now. But your biggest advantage um, as a euphonium player who's going to double on tuba is the musicianship you've already developed. Okay, take that musicianship and apply it to the instrument from day one. Right, we get to play so many beautiful melodies. We get to play high-flying technical passages. We know how to do it. All we have to do is apply what we already know um, to to a different instrument, to a larger instrument. Um, I asked about low register, okay, and low register surprisingly wasn't something that gave people very much trouble um, initially, um, but we need to, I need to kind of mention that uh, it wasn't as big a problem as they thought up front, okay, but then getting it to be at a point where it's consistent, trustable, usable, in tune, uh, and clear was something that did take uh, significant practice over time.
Okay, so we've got a few quotes there. Um, Gretchen Renshaw, James again, I used etudes geared towards low register playing for the contrabass tuba. I also played contrabass tuba etudes on my F tuba to help work on the low range. Um, and Matthew Scheich said, I would work out of the West, Japes, uh, West Jacobs edition of the complete vocalizers for Bordoni, down an octave, as well as the Snedeker low etudes for tuba. Okay, so a couple of great recommendations um, for books that you can use. Uh, to work on the low register. The middle register um, was unusually difficult for our participants, okay? Um, it was something that people don't assume is going to be a problem, but actually was very difficult. And initially, most of our participants experienced a double buzz in this register. I'm talking about uh, low C below the staff, really through C in the staff, kind of that octave, um, but especially around G, A, and B flat in the staff. Um, many of uh, our um, interviewees, whether they started on contrabass or bass tuba, had difficulty with this register. Okay, the reason for this is that um, the musculature is trained to respond um, to the sound and this range in a way on the euphonium. Okay, um, it knows what to do when I want to make that sound, right? Blow the air and then my face knows how to make that sound. But it does not operate in the same way on tuba, right? We actually have to, again, think of the sound concept that we want, but from a tuba perspective, not euphonium, and then we have to relax and trust the lips, okay? This too is one of the biggest reverse benefits, okay, the uh, Dan Parentoniism, I think if there ever was one, was uh, trust the lips, right? Uh, trust the lips, son. And as a euphonium player, we're all told that, trust the lips, rely on the air, um, and uh, from my perspective, I always thought I was doing it, right? I always thought that I was just relying on air and trusting the lips, and then I played tuba, and I tried to do it the way I always do, and I realized that it really doesn't work at all, right? I wasn't, in fact, trusting the lips. I wasn't relying on the airflow, okay? Uh, in my lessons, again, with Don Little, I was trying to play something one day, and he goes, Hey, Vince, uh, you're working too hard. And I said, I was like, what? And he goes, I know you like to work hard. You're very organized. You get all your stuff done. Uh, but if you're trying to force the tuba to do what you want it to do, uh, and you're fighting it, and it's going to fight back, and the tube is going to win, right? And so that's what he told me, and he was like, you just have to relax, set the lip, blow slow air past the lip, and then use that uh, for your sound concept. When I learned how to do this on tuba, um, I would say that's probably the, the most, the largest increase in my euphonium ability came from learning this, because um, I had no idea how much work I was doing, um, and even though I was far into a doctorate, um, I had something that uh, helped me out immensely, okay, and that I'm very thankful for. Okay, high register, uh, we'll kind of speed through a couple so we can get to some questions. Uh, not an issue for some, but not a foregone conclusion that the, every euphonium player has a stellar high range. Okay, you still, um, it's not going to be automatic for some people, um, but I uh, encourage you to approach the range with confidence, okay? The, the lip is used to operating in that upper register, and as long as it's informed with the right airspeed, um, you should be able to play, um, and through practice it wasn't a very large problem for many. For slurring and flexibility, um, one thing that I would love to read here is Matthew Scheip's quote, Amateur Flexibility. He says, it's the second quote there, he says, this was a memorable challenge for me. Ben Pierce would have me work on the interval studies out of the Arbin at various dynamics and in various styles. The goal was to use as little effort as possible and let the change in the air do the work for you, not the change in the euphonium. Again, what I was just talking about, uh, trying to muscle things into place. And then the next one there, the challenges with this were basically the same as the issues with middle range and sound concept. When I slur, I tend to revert back to the euphonium playing style, and this leads to a bright, harsh tone, okay? Um, so again, we have this idea um, of the tuba air and the euphonium air, um, and relying on that air rather than trying to muscle things into place, okay? For articulation, um, the most difficulties that were experienced were experienced in the low register are uh, the individuals interviewed did not have a change in tongue speed, um, they said that they could single, double, and triple tongue at generally the same speeds, um, but that uh, tonguing in the low register was its own endeavor. Um, let's see, Matthew Scheibs here, no big difficulties here, but I will mention that I had to drastically change how I articulate for the low register on tuba. I find that while the contact point is still between the tongue and where the top teeth meet the gum line, where this point of contact is made goes further and further back on the tongue, on the, lo the lower the note is. 
Okay, so he's actually talking about changing his tongue position for those low notes, and we're often told never let your tongue go forward at all or you know, change position as euphonium players, but um, that is uh, apparently necessary for uh, the tuba playing that you would be doing. Okay, intonation. Biggest difference here is that you can push and pull slides. We are used to moving things into place with our face. Okay, um, okay, my A is going to be super low on my <laughs> on my euphonium, so I fix that with my face. My F is going to be sharp, so I fix that with my face. I was playing with a uh, tuba euphonium quartet on an F tuba, uh, and it was my D flat, right? And it was massively sharp because it was a two three combo. Um, so I tried to fix it with my face, and I was playing the other tuba player in the group. Um, I said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm just I'm trying to get this note in tune." He said, "You see that?" that pipe right there, he said, pull on that pipe, and so I did, right, and he goes, try it again, better or worse, I said, better, because it was in tune, it was, in, the tone was correct, um, but I was a euphonium player, so I was going, yeah, right, I was trying to do this, all this stuff, um, just pull the pipe, okay, we forget that it's there, it makes things easier. Finger facility, not a problem, problem for most, again, um, uh, the the use of the fifth valve is something that takes time to learn, and if you plan on teaching tuba, um, uh, I would strongly recommend using a tuba that is non-compensating for that purpose so that you're used to it and so you, that you can recommend its use to your students. Okay, if you're not familiar with it, um, then you wouldn't uh, be able to do that. When it comes to learning the fingers, when you start, um, just do it cold turkey. Okay. There are lots of people who try to relate it to a different system, which can help you in the first couple weeks, um, but over time this becomes cumbersome. Okay? Keith Kyle was the, um, the person who talked the most about this. He said, I used to relate it all to euphonium, um, but then four weeks in I'm starting to get all of these things confused um, because he's actually getting used to the tuba. Um, so what I recommend is just sit down and learn the different fingerings for the different horn. In four weeks you'll be flying and you won't have to think about it anymore. Okay? Reading. Uh, we might think I read bass clef already and it's not going to be a challenge, um, but the real challenge um, is just ledger lines. Okay, You will be operating um, with a number of ledger lines on a consistent basis that you are not used to. Um, for uh, We have one recommendation to use Roshu Etudes down an octave um, uh, in order to work on the low range. That's a great recommendation. Um, the only negative thing with that is that you don't get the experience of reading the ledger lines. Okay, that is an actual thing that I would consider a skill um, that needs to be practiced. So if you can uh, complement that uh, with the Snedeker Etudes or uh, with any other book, uh, Gregoriev, whatever it is, that is um, written down in that range, then that will actually help you uh, to become familiar with reading because it is um, unusual. Okay, uh, Keith Kyle had another interesting quote here. He said, in orchestral and band excerpt playing and audition prep, a euphonium player is expected to be able to sight read more challenging parts than a tuba player will ever have to prepare. Okay? That's another huge advantage we have. Right? We're preparing for sight reading for auditions on these you know, very difficult excerpts um, and oftentimes the things that are thrown in front of us on tuba are not quite um, as difficult. It, it appears easy, so that's a benefit um, that we can make use of. Okay? General overcoming issues. Um, most of our people uh, recommended focusing on similarities rather than differences, but similarities in the fact of um, uh, the sound concept in the Arnold Jacobs um, you know, song and wind that we discussed. Focus on that similarities. What do you want to sound like? How can your wind inform that? Okay. Um, one other big one, chamber music. Get involved with chamber music. If you begin playing tuba, either playing a brass quintet or a uh, brass, uh, low brass quartet. Okay. The nice thing about the low brass quartet um, is that there's another tuba player, and remember the guy who told me how to you know, push and pull the valves? That was a free lesson. Okay, we were all playing, we were doing that. I didn't have lessons at the time, but I sat next to him and he gave me information I needed to become a better tuba player. Okay, so that was a free lesson. Um, it forces you to pull your weight. It forces you to learn how to um, tune the instrument. It forces you to learn how to ma match articulation. It forces you to do all these musical things, um, but in a way that's enjoyable. Hopefully you'll do it with some friends um, and you can see massive increases in your skills through that. Um, let's see. We're going to move on just to make sure we get time for questions here. Um, literature recommendations, we should briefly touch on this. Begin with music that you know, okay? Music that isn't challenging to your ear so that you know um, the pitch that you're trying to produce, 
okay? Begin with that music, whatever it is, okay? Whether it's Roshu, uh, Tyrell, whatever books you're used to playing out with, start there, right? And then once you're comfortable there and you don't, you can only think about so many things at once, right? A lot of people would argue you can only think about one thing at once. So if you're trying to figure out fingerings or if you're trying to figure out your sound concept, then pitch is something you don't want to be thinking about. Okay, once you, you get those fingerings and you get sound concept more under your belt, then we can transition to material that is new. Okay, um, Whether you want that new material to be uh, excerpts, solos, uh, if you want to learn jazz, right? I recommend you can kill two birds with one stone. I, ha I was fortunate to have lessons with Carl Kleinstuber for a semester on jazz tuba because as a euphonium player, no one ever invited me to jazz rehearsal, so I've got this massive gap in my knowledge uh, about American music and that I don't play the I don't play jazz. I don't know how to improvise, right? So I was learning tuba, so it's like, well I may as well learn how to play a bass line at the same time, right? Reading those reading uh, the chord figures, reading all um, all of this new music and that has been massively fun and way rewarding to do um, because now I'm starting to feel more comfortable with it. Okay. Um Let's get to some questions here. Last thing, let me wrap up real quick before we do questions. Where would you be without the double? Um, for some people, this was a difficult question um, because they weren't sure where they would be if they hadn't done it. Uh, but most agreed um, that they wouldn't be where they were today if they hadn't finally branched out and doubled. Okay? And when I presented all this information to Dr. Bowman, uh, kind of his, uh, I guess I'd call it a concern, is that what are we going to do with this information? Right? Is this information designed, you know, because someone could take this and say, well, if you do tuba, well, then it makes it more possible to get a job. That's a more valuable instrument. We're just going to, you know, so I do euphonium, but, right, you know, that, that gets pushed to the wayside. But the, I, that's not the point here. Um, I think the point here is if we're euphonium players and if we're trying to advocate for the instrument, um, we need uh, to make sure we have a seat at the table. Right? Um, and that seat at the table, um, we have it here in the military bands. At the collegiate level, how do we gain it? Right? If we have two, you know, just euphonium teachers, one at Indiana University, one at University of North Texas, then how do we continue to make sure that euphonium players are employed at the highest level and are teaching at the highest level? Um, and while I would love to say, let's just make sure that euphonium players get employed, right, there are going to need to be some in intermediate steps there. Okay? And I think this is an intermediate step that can ensure we have more euphonium players continuing uh, to get uh, positions where they can um, have influence in the community uh, and continue to advocate for the instrument. Okay, so just kind of uh, to wrap that up there, uh, huge thank you to the interviewees, huge thank you to Dr. Bowman, Don Little, and David Childs for helping me out with this research, um, and also a huge thank you to the Army for having me out today. We are going to finish today with some question and answer with Dr. Benjamin Pierce, so please help me to welcome up uh, the man with the plan, this is Dr. Benjamin Pierce. The question for those of you online was uh, mouthpiece and rim size selecting going from euphonium to tuba. Any recommendations? Well, that's, that's a whole can of worms, isn't it? <laughs> uh, thanks for having me up here, Vince. I, um, I would choose something middle of the road. If you're a euphonium player going to tuba, um, you want to avoid the tendency to look for a mouthpiece that's really small, you know, close to euphonium size. Go for a mouthpiece that's going to give you a characteristic sound on the instrument. Um, and boy, there are so many mouthpieces nowadays, I'm not even sure what to recommend. Con Helberg is a really standard, um, a lot of students using that. A Schilke Helberg is another one. Um, PT, mm, PT 65 for a F tuba, 64, something in that range. And of course, that's going to vary a lot just depending on the individual. I've always tended towards mouthpieces that are a little more narrow, just because I think my, my palate is a little more narrow. So how do you split practice time between both when you're just starting? I think that's another whole big can of worms, and you know, I don't consider myself at all an expert on any of these things. It really depends on who you are, what your goals are, what you're trying to accomplish, and also what interests you, what motivates you, and we're all at different places in life. and. Um, I'm in a place where I'm not trying to get a job, I'm trying to find things that uh, will excite me musically. Um, so splitting my time these days is much different from how splitting time for you would be, because this is Ryan, my student, he is 
will be down the down the road trying to get a job. Um, so preparing, I'm playing a euphonium recital later today. I haven't been playing any tuba for several weeks. I've been focusing on what, what I'm going to do today. As soon as I get back home, I've got to start thinking about sounding like a tuba player again so I can play in a faculty quintet. And also just thinking about where, um, where my musical interests are going to take me next. Uh, it's much different from when you're a student and you have this non-stop grind of things that you just have to do. So splitting your time always has to depend on your goals, but I think I would just um, reinforce something you said earlier, Vince, uh, that uh, your primary instrument your, is your primary voice as a musician, and you've always got to be developing that further and further and further, rather than worrying about um, you know, playing multiple instruments. That's got to be something that is the icing on the cake, because you're this, you've got to be the same musician on every instrument you play, and you've always got to be advancing as a musician. So you really have to find, figure out how to balance your time based on that. I like to start on tuba. I usually try to work my way up on a daily basis from the bigger instrument to the smaller. And then a good night's sleep is sort of a reset button for me. And I rarely go in the other direction because I just find that it doesn't sound very good. Uh, that's me. Um, and we, when we talk about doubling, I think it's very difficult to do doubling in the sense that you play one horn and then put it down and pick up the other one and play it and then put that down and switch back and forth like that. Um, of course, musicians in, in pit orchestras will do that sort of thing, but I think with the major mouthpiece difference, there's always going to be an adjustment period if you want to sound your very best. Um, if I've had a layoff on the tuba, I'm going to go into, uh, yes, a rebuilding process where I have a, you know, an hour, maybe an hour worth of low, easy playing just to kind of get that sound developed again. And similarly for the euphonium, there's just got to be kind of a re-acclimation period. You don't forget anything, you've just got to, you've just got to readjust the chops. Um, I'm a person, I'm not afraid to take breaks. You know, I'll take a month off completely from playing here and there. Some brass players won't do that for fear that they won't remember what to do when they, when they come back to it. Um, but I think if you've got, you know, got the music up here and you just have a good idea of, you know, what it's going to take physically, to get things going again, it's good to have that time away. He is asking about thoughts on rotor euphoniums or baritones. I think unless you're in Germany, that <laughs> you're not going to encounter very many of those. <laughs> That's about all, all, the extent of my thoughts. Let's leave that for the Germany conference coming up here. <laughs> uh, thank you again for your time. Thank you to the Army Band, and thank you everyone for being here.